You've heard of speed writing, folks. Well, all day since I heard Tom mention red cards, I've been practicing speed talking. Okay, so we'll just have a go. Um, I'm never comfortable speaking in public, so please bear with me. I mean, the theocratic minister school was bad enough. You know, this, this, this is not good. Okay, it might be appropriate for me to start um, with a quotation from Raymond Franz's book, In Search of Christian Freedom, which caught my eye as soon as I read it. He writes, I believe that the combination of evidence reveals why it is reasonable to say that sensitive and emotionally fragile persons in particular are at risk in what is called a spiritual paradise. The woman you see here today is not the woman who sat in total despair at a circuit assembly two years ago. I've grown in strength and stature and spirituality until even I hardly recognize myself. Okay, this is my story. Like it or hate it, condone it or condemn it, it's my story, how I became involved with the Watchtower Society. Okay, you need a little background, just a brief one. I was born during World War II, and for those of you who are trying to work it out, <laughs> I was the result of a, a brief and much regretted liaison during the war. I was a source of embarrassment and irritation to my mother. She married later, quite respectably, and gave birth to a half-brother for me. When my mother was loud and brash, I was sensitive and extremely shy. She was impatient, and I had a feeling for the underdog. She bloomed with health, but I was frequently ill. She reveled in men friends, and I was very withdrawn in the presence of the opposite sex. They found solace in their small son, and found me a very unsatisfactory daughter. This then was the setting for the day in 1954. I was 11 years old. Worked out? Yep. <laughs> okay. When my mother accepted the offer of three books from a lady who called at the door, a Bible study was begun, and whilst I was not allowed to be present by my mother, I had the curiosity of a child, and I listened behind the door. I was fascinated by what I heard. Very soon, a loving Jehovah, for that was God's name, I was told, was going to make a paradise earth for us all to live on. We wouldn't go to heaven. That was reserved for just a few Jehovah's Witnesses, and that was fine. But we'd never grow old. We would never die, and we could play with the wild animals all day long. But of course, they would no longer be wild. Perusing the books in secret behind my mother's back, I found illustrations of a wonderful garden with tropical blooms and a little girl playing with a coloured bird on her hand, tiger cubs, mum looking on. It sounded wonderful, it looked wonderful. All we had to do was to love God and tell other people what he'd promised us and wait for the battle between Jehovah and Satan the devil, which was coming very soon in 1954. I was startled to learn that Jesus had not died on a cross but an upright stake, but I was delighted to discover that we wouldn't go to hell because it didn't exist. My mother discontinued her study after a few months, but I took my small courage in my hands and approached the Bible lady to ask whether she would teach me. To my delight, I got permission. Twice a week, I went to Sister Jean's house and learned what God had in store for those who loved him. All we had to do, it seemed, was to preach the good news of the kingdom. It sounded easy enough. Who would be stupid enough to refuse with all this paradise to come? But I was told that millions would turn away from the good news of the kingdom and they'd die at Armageddon. I hoped I wouldn't have to watch all this death. That, that perturbed me a lot. I was disconcerted to be told the scriptures said that we would have to clear up all the dead bodies, billions of them. But a few months later, I felt a lot better about this because we were told the birds of the air would do it instead, and this was, this was the original new light from Jehovah. I was introduced to the Kingdom Hall before very long. There were very few Kingdom Halls around at that time. Our meetings were usually held in rented labour halls, corporate or wherever. This is a new, rather bare building, no windows, no decoration, as I seen in Sunday school. The congregation was very small and dominated by members of the anointed class of Jehovah's Witnesses who were all going to go to heaven to be with Jesus and reign as kings with him. I was terribly in awe of these men. <coughs> Most of them had come out of Babylon the Great, the world empire of false religion, for all churches, of course, were part of this and all led by Satan. Several of the anointed had been ministers or lay preachers, and they'd been reared in the tradition of damnation and hellfire. They, they were quite someone. The meetings seemed interminable to a 12-year-old. At that time, they could last up to three hours at a time, and if you think you had it rough, believe me, in the early days, it was rough. <laughs> no one protested. No one would have... I certainly would never have dared. Okay. Male speakers, of course, women weren't permitted to teach, and they all seemed to have a very nice appreciation of their own worth. 
Much of the contents teachings at this time, I was 12 years old, went over my head. But what I did understand, I never doubted. I loved Sister Jean very much, and if she believed, so did I. Much was made at the meetings at that time of the fear of God. And into my head as a child came this image of a dark and forbidding God. He could only be placated by works. He couldn't be approached. He was angry all the time. Faith without works, we were told all the time, was dead. I was introduced to the door-to-door work, accompanying always an adult witness. I was extremely shy, far too shy to try and preach the good news by myself, but I was very proud to fill in the report forms which I knew were going to go to headquarters, although I never actually said anything beyond a timid greeting for years. Baptism came when I was 13. It took place in Hinkley, Leicestershire, in a hired swimming pool during a district assembly. The first immersion failed as I was so nervous and it had to be repeated, which was perhaps an omen for the future. At the time of my baptism, I understood so little of what was happening. I actually thought that after Armageddon, we would all be naked and live in mud huts out of which we would crawl. (laughs) I didn't like the idea of being naked at all, but I just assumed that Jehovah would program our minds so we wouldn't know we were naked. It wouldn't matter, you see. The great scandal came after my baptism and it split the congregation. The teenage son of Sister Jean, her only child, fell in love with a married witness some years his senior. And upon the situation being discovered, he committed suicide. He was 18 years old. I went to the funeral. There were six of us there. There was no funeral talk and no comfort for the mother who was told that her son would never have a resurrection for the sin of taking his own life. The congregation became a hotbed of gossip. Sides were taken. Half the congregation was speaking to the bereaved mother, and the other half was taken to the side of the sister who was involved in this. And a brother from Bethel had to come down from Bethel headquarters and and, and sort us all out. But it was a very bewildering time for a child. I was afraid to talk to one side or the other in case I offended someone. Matters finally settled in the congregation, but not for me. My unhappiness at what was happening at home since an uncle had come to live with us was increasing and I ran away I was returned very promptly to the fury of my parents who told me they couldn't live with a disgrace and the anger of the congregation committee who castigated me for my sin towards my parents and towards Jehovah no one thought of asking the troubled young girl what had been happening at home it wasn't that sort of era I was simply too terrified of having to appear before the committee consisting solely of men to be able to utter a single word. The committee placed me on a period of probation, which meant that I had to prove myself spiritually repentant over a period of 12 months, after which they would review the situation. This decision was announced publicly to the congregation, and I felt terribly alone. I was not quite 15 years old. The inevitable happened, of course, meeting attendance began to fall away and I had a continual stream of visits from the members of the anointed who caused me to understand I was fast relinquishing my hold and everlasting life. The nightmares which were to plague me my entire life began at this stage. I became terribly tense. My schoolwork was affected. I performed badly in my examinations. I did not return to the Kingdom Hall and at the age of 14 and a half I was disfellowshipped for breaking the terms of my probation. The following two years were extremely difficult. Insomnia had become part of my life. I would spend the night hours reading under the bed covers with a torch. I was terrified of Armageddon. My teenage years had been taken up with attendance at the Kingdom Hall, so I was at something of a disadvantage when it came to being a normal teenager. When a young man asked me out, I determined to marry him almost before I knew his name. I wanted to have babies. I wanted to cram everything in before Armageddon came, which was coming any minute and I was going to die. So at the age of 20, I acquired a husband and two of the babies I wanted so much. After the birth of my son, I suffered from postnatal depression, combined with scenes from Armageddon, and I thought I was going out of my mind. I'd been shown Watchtower literature as a child, portraying people dying horribly by falling into great chasms at Armageddon, and I began seeing these images in my dreams. I knew that Jehovah would annihilate children along with their unbelieving parents, and I had to take the responsibility for my babies. I had made a geographical move after my marriage, 
and I approached the congregation at my local Kingdom Hall and I explained my disfellowship state to them. The solution was coldly explained to me. I must enter the Kingdom Hall as the meeting began and sit in the back row. I must not speak to anyone and I must not allow anyone to speak to me. If I was approached, I had to explain that I was in a disfellowship state. For a full year, I attended all meetings with my babies, following the instructions, earning my redemption. During this time, I learned later, a sister had asked the elders if she could approach me with encouragement, but her request was refused. I was now a fully accredited witness again, although I was most relieved that I was certainly not happy. It didn't occur to me that I should be. <laughs> Leading the life required by the organisation, it was, it was simply no easier than it had ever been earlier. But I was determined not to put a foot wrong this time. I threw myself into the meetings and into the work. I took my children with me in order to inculcate the witness teachings and practices into them. My husband would have nothing to do with a strange religion his wife was practicing, and he objected to my constant absences, but I was hell-bent in becoming the perfect Jehovah's Witness. About this time, a rumor ran through the congregation about various bedroom practices engaged in by married witnesses. It was hinted darkly that such practices were forbidden. I hadn't the least idea what was meant. <laughs> I was so frightened of offending Jehovah, I made excuses not to sleep with my husband. The inevitable happened, and my husband began seeing someone else, and I cared little. I was so intent on placating Jehovah God. He had become superfluous. We eventually separated, and I returned to my hometown with my children. I rented a large and dilapidated old house, joined my local congregation, laboured continually in the belief I would never be good enough to associate with my brothers and sisters. And I would arrive quietly and try to merge into the background just as the meeting began, and I would leave as soon as the final song was sung. I had little to say. I made few friends except one very determined sister who enrolled me in the ministry school, but I also took the part of the householder who had very little to say. I joined my brothers and sisters daily for the door-to-door -door work, but because I was still very shy, I would collect a territory map from the Kingdom Hall and put in pioneer hours working alone, pushing a pram door-to-door. -door. Jehovah's Witnesses at that time were not as well known as they are today, and special pioneers used to arrive in our congregation on a regular basis to cover the territory. Because I had a large house and apparently no one else was terribly willing, I was asked to put up the special pioneers, and I was thrilled. I was thrilled. I thought Jehovah had chosen me. I thought it was a mark of his, his approval that I should be asked to sort of care for the pioneers, special pioneers when they arrived. And I did this for years, six months at a time, a pair of special pioneers for years. Okay, they paid me £1.50 each week towards the cost of keeping them, 30 bob. I remember that. <laughs> it wasn't a lot of money even then. <laughs> okay, li life was hard, but I, th I felt Jehovah was looking very kind on me at this time. The pioneers, of course, were very special people. They were collected by car and taken to the meetings. There was no room in the car for me or my children, so I walked miles, but I bore them no rancour whatsoever. We knew the pioneers were special people. They were, they were a special case. The Tuesday group was also held at my house for many years. An odd incident did occur during the stay of one set of special pioneers, which will stay in my mind forever. It was a very, very uncomfortable time. One of the pioneers began missing small articles of clothing, and she determined that demonic activity was taking place in the house. I was very, very perturbed about this, but I couldn't imagine the demons being particularly interested in the odd sock, you know, which was actually going missing. <laughs> Nonetheless, um, she called in the congregation overseer who came along with a couple of members of the anointed and they prayed very hard in the house, you know, particularly around a small cupboard area where apparently these, small, these, these socks were sort of disappearing. Um, I had my reservations about this, but I felt extremely guilty. Um, demonic activity, there was a lot of it about at that time. <laughs> um, I didn't go down well at the Kingdom Hall. Some of the brothers and sisters looked at me quite askance. However... I would sometimes leave my young son with a babysitter when I went to the Kingdom Hall, if he was particularly asthmatic. And I had my suspicions about the babysitter. And when I actually saw her one day wearing a sweater belonging to one of the pioneers, you know, my suspicions were confirmed. But it was an uncomfortable time, all that demonic activity. <laughs> In my late 20s, I learned that my husband had died. I was saddened, but I was free. Months earlier, I had witnessed to a man who claimed to be in the throes of demonic position, a possession. He was very, very frightened. I arranged a Bible study for him with a male witness, and he made enormous strides into the truth so fast, you wouldn't believe it, speedometer. 
He proposed marriage, and I was thrilled. I'd come to care for him very, very much. However, out of the blue one day, I received a visit from our presiding overseer, who told me I must consider my engagement at an end. The day is still very clear in my mind. No reason was given. I was not permitted to be alone with my fiancé to ask him why he'd made this decision. But three weeks later, he married one of the special pioneers who was staying with me. <laughs> OK, rejection. Yeah, I succumbed to depression. I, I stopped attending meetings. Meetings just... OK, I was visited by witnesses who accused me loudly of not having faith, whatever that may have meant. I turned to alcohol to help me sleep, and I combined this with pretty powerful sleeping pills from my doctor. I became an automation. I'm all too aware that my children suffered during this time. My suicide attempt was inevitable. I spent a week in hospital earnestly explaining to my doctors that I was certainly not fit to enter into the new world, so there's no point in living in this one, and to this day I'd love to see my medical records. <laughs> OK, I recovered my equilibrium slowly over the months. I had no visits from anyone at the Kingdom Hall. I received help and friendship from the people I'd been taught to regard as worldly, my neighbours. I took a job, gained a little confidence. I'd begun living the life of a modern young woman, but I was very, very frightened inside. I never mentioned my religious background to my new friends. I'm not proud of the life I lived for the next few years, and I do try not to think back on it. The spectre of the organisation reared its head constantly and coloured all my actions. I was condemned. It didn't matter what I did. I was going to die anyway. I had no concept whatsoever of a loving God. Only he who demanded such perfection. How could I explain what it was like to anyone in the world under the veneer? I visited my parents several times during the next couple of years. One occasion stands in my mind. My brother, my half-brother, the young half-brother, had become a Jehovah's Witness, a ministerial servant, an elder, and finally the presiding overseer. My mother referred to him as a saint. Okay. He was too saintly, apparently, to do any gardening or decorating for my parents. His, his spiritual duties took up too much time. But I went to visit them, and he was due to visit my parents, and uh, it was hinted very strongly that he would find it uncomfortable being in the same house as his sister. I was no longer an active witness. So I took myself off and spent a very cold and wet Sunday afternoon wandering around the town. I got back drenched, only to find my brother's car was still in the drive and I had to go to a neighbour. <laughs> I bore no rancour for this. I genuinely thought it was my due. I had no right to be under the same roof as my brother, who was a practising Jehovah's Witness and, and an overseer into the bargain. OK. Over the next few years, restless, very restless, and feeling without roots, I made several house moves. Wherever I went, I would find my local congregation... I would slip in and out of meetings, and two people became curious about me. Then I would simply move again. I would take out a subscription to the Watchtower and the Awake magazines, painfully aware of what I thought I'd lost. 1975 drew near. We all know what Any, Anybody here familiar with the lead-up to 1975? Yeah, OK, fine. How tense were you? Anybody tense here about it? We sold our house. <laughs> OK, OK. I was an inactive witness. You can imagine my feelings about this. The autumn of 1975, God was going to zap me. Okay, fine. 1975 came and went. To say that I was immensely relieved, and we're putting it very, very mildly indeed. I had no way of knowing any more than the average Jehovah's Witnesses today about the long history of failed prophecies about the end of the world. I do recall, actually, some elders and circuit servants actually stating that Armageddon would begin in the autumn of 1975. Still attending meetings, still witnessing informally to anybody who would listen to me, and breaking my heart at the memorial meetings, I married again in 1979. I thought wildly that Jehovah might be giving people like me another chance, and I promptly contacted my local kingdom hall and flung myself into activity. I insisted my husband had a Bible study, and I was thrilled when he agreed. We were all set. We were going to go through again together. A pioneer sister took it on herself to officially reintroduce me to the ministry work. And one day we went from house to house in a rather deprived neighbourhood. An elderly and very frightened lady wouldn't come to the door. She spoke to us at the letterbox. I was terribly concerned that she should have something to read, so I pushed watched her magazine for the letterbox for her, and 
in return, I got what I could only describe as a tirade from the pioneer sister standing at the side of me. How could I do this? How could I give literature away? Didn't I know that it was spoiling it for other witnesses if I didn't take the money for it? And I must never, ever do this again. I was terribly taken back, terribly taken back by this attitude. Okay, I was now a mature and somewhat more confident woman. I began to find so much to her articles of study were causing me, causing me some concern. Jesus Christ was not the mediator for all of us, only for the 144,000 anointed. This class would intercede for us with Jesus Christ. I'd given little thought to Jesus over the years. He was, although important, merely a creation of Jehovah, also being the Archangel Michael. The article, however, smacked of the intercession of the saints' doctrine of the Catholic Church. I voiced doubts to no one. Jehovah's Witnesses do fear the Judicial Committee. They have the power of life or death spiritually over individuals. I also had at the back of my mind the prospect of seeing the bodies of millions of little children at Armageddon. We'd been told we'd have to clean up the bodies or possibly we could leave it to the birds of the air. I was never entirely sure which teaching was in force at the time, but it still left the sight of all those bodies. I've been taught that parents took responsibility for their offspring, hence the importance of contacting everyone we could on the door-to-door work. It certainly served to confirm in my mind that Jehovah was a god of vengeance. His name would be vindicated at all costs. We were to thank Jehovah for all the information he released to his people in his due time, but I found prayer as difficult as always. It was arid. I could not reconcile myself to a god with such a harsh and unbending nature. It seemed he could be vindictive and loving at the same time. We were told he was a god of love. It was dispassionate enough to coldly arrange the death of billions. I tried very hard to see that his proposed actions were justified, but I feared him very much. Thinking about red card, Tom. (laughs) I'm taking two chunks out of this. We were warned against thinking independently as members of Jehovah's organisation. We were to look to the organisation as our mother, whose wisdom came from Jehovah himself via Jesus Christ. Running ahead of Jehovah's organisation was a phrase frequently used when brothers held minor doubts, and we were definitely cautioned against this. <coughs> New light from Jehovah came very regularly, of course, to be shed upon a particular doctrine, and some changed entirely. But waiting on Jehovah for enlightenment was the policy, and I never heard any complaints from my brothers and sisters. I thought I was at fault in lacking faith in our mother organisation. On one occasion, I telephoned my son to ask why the organisation insisted on the date of 607 BC for the destruction of Jerusalem, when world historians to a man disagreed. My son angrily accused me of reading apostate literature. In actual fact, I was reading a book on Egyptian history. But there you go. The announcement from the platform at the Kingdom Hall during a service meeting was greeted with bated breath by my brothers and sisters and great apprehension by me. Literature distribution in the immediate future was to be a simplified arrangement. It was to be offered to the public without charge. The faithful and discreet slave had decided on this move, it was rumoured, because the end was so near. I remember 1975 and wondered how certain it was this time, but it couldn't possibly be another mistake. It was pointed out to the congregation that the literature produced by our brothers, hard-working brothers at Bethel, had to be paid for somehow. And of course, brothers were appealed to use their conscience. In effect... We simply paid for the literature as normal, but very a contribution box. Demonstrations took place on the platform. How are we going to ask the householder for a small donation, a small contribution towards the literature that we, we were going to place? With? And it didn't occur to me at all until years afterwards that society was getting twice the money it had originally. I didn't understand the true reason for this simplified arrangement for, for some years. Further Watchtower articles appeared dealing with the sexual lies of married Jehovah's Witnesses. These articles were more explicit, and of course they banned certain practices between married couples. And not a few of the congregation were quite seriously affected. We were not all married to Jehovah's Witnesses. I was certainly affected. My husband had long since discontinued his studies and his association. I was phlegmatic because he loved money. He was a wealthy man. But I wasn't prepared to... I wasn't prepared for his request for a divorce. Well, I've been holding down a demanding full-time job, attending five meetings a week, and going from door to door in every spare moment I had. He felt neglected <laughs> and decided he wanted his freedom. The only grounds for divorce permitted by the Bible, according to the organisation, were those of adultery, and my husband furnished me with that evidence. OK, alone again. My children both married to other witnesses, although they did live at different ends of the country. 
Both I knew had suspected for some time I was uneasy with some doctrines from God's sole channel of communication to mankind. Though it was never discussed, sometimes excuses were made when I asked to see my grandchildren. I had for some time understood that I had a birth father, and I set out to find out whether he was still alive and whether he would welcome a daughter. I approached my mother, by this time a practicing Jehovah's Witness, and asked her for details of the past, but she erupted furiously, and an estrangement came about between us. This is a difficult part. I'm going to skim over this one. She and my foster father died within the next 12 months, and both expressed the desire that I was not to be told. They didn't want to see me. Um, very, very difficult. I had apparently upset them far too much with my request for details about my birth father when it was all supposed to have been buried. My brother sent me a letter. I hadn't heard from him for years. He was too busy with his spiritual duties, of course. <laughs> and uh, said he'd like to meet me for a cup of coffee. And uh, came down to South End and calmly told me within the space of about ten seconds that both my parents were dead. It was a very, very difficult time. I blame myself continually for this. I was full of guilt and grief. I approached an elder for help at my kingdom hall. I was desperate. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. The guilt was terrible. The grief was awful. The shock. He handed me a hardbound copy of the Watchtower with a slip of paper in and said, when you finish with that, just put it back in the library. And that was the extent of the help I had from the Kingdom of Hall. I knew the only chance of seeing my mother again was in the New World when she was resurrected. She'd been a better frame of mind then, knowing I too had survived the Battle of Armageddon. And as she grew to perfection, she would become close to me. She would perhaps tell me she loved me as she had never done during her life. These thoughts spurred me on. I became assiduous in association with the organisation, but my heart was raw. Early in 1999, I made the usual arrangements to travel some distance to a district assembly. Watching it. <laughs> Having seated myself, you concentrate, take notes. I hated assemblies. I was never stupid enough to say so. I disliked assemblies terribly. All that travelling, upheaval, you're usually tired by the time you arrive, okay, then you've got to sit through the whole thing, then you've got to get back at night, and you keep this up for days, okay? All this spiritual food, spiritual indigestion, we born like it. Okay. I don't miss sitting for an hour. I find I'd lost the thread of the programme. We all know how fatal that is, that you lose the thread of the programme and assembly, you'll never pick it back up again, <laughs> okay? I thought, if everlasting life means everlasting meetings and assemblies, I don't want any of this. I got up and walked out, and to this day I never understand the impulse that made me do it. I walked around the town, defiant, guilty, convinced I was never going to get through Armageddon. I reached home safely, and the following day I went to my local library, walked past the shelf, and there upon the shelf, sitting all alone, a little paperback book. Susan Thorne, 15 years as a Jehovah's Witness. Okay. Apostate! <laughs> Don't touch it. Don't go near it. It's going to burn your fingers. I walked straight past it, and I just backtracked, and I picked it up. Okay. I thought, the heck? God's going to zap me at Armageddon, in for a penny, in for a pound. What's one more sin? I took it home. All right. I sat up reading it. I craved it like a baby. It was amazing. A newborn baby couldn't have been more precious than that book. All right. I took it home, and I finished reading it at half past one in the morning, and I felt very, very uneasy. I went back and checked the scriptures that Susan quoted about the deity of Christ, and I was even more uneasy. She mentioned the Reach Out Trust in the book, but gave no further details. I checked direct inquiries, I checked Samaritans, nobody heard of the Reach Out Trust, didn't know where they were. The very next day, I walked up to a parade of shops I'd never been to before, and there was a postcard in the window of a small shop I'd never visited before that said, are you looking for help? Are you a Jehovah's Witness? Contact the Reach Out Trust. Okay, there it was. <laughs> Flew home. <laughs> Um, wrote this very, very incoherent letter. They must have thought they were hearing from a mad woman. Okay, two days to get a reply. Went back to the library in the meantime. Computer, had they got another book about Jehovah's Witnesses? Lo and behold, they had. And the book was by Doug Harris, who turned out to be the director of the Reach Out Trust. <laughs> okay. Do I need to tell you what I discovered? Do I need to tell you? The shock, the terrible shock, the revelations, the knowledge that I had been manipulated, deceived, 
lied to, used, and abused for 45 years. Marley Cole, anyone heard of him? Okay, wrote the book. Did you believe that he was a Jehovah's Witness? Did you think he was an independent author? No, yeah, we were all taught that he was an independent author, and it turns out he'd been an elder for years. Okay, now I did just small things like that. And the simplified arrangement and the Jimmy Swagger, the shock followed upon shock upon shock. Okay, this took three days. Three days, two books, 45 years. Okay. I knelt. I wasn't going to call God Jehovah anymore. I didn't like the connotations. I didn't know whether he was there or not. I thought I'd try. Knelt down, opened up my heart and just said, okay, okay, if you're there, here's a challenge. Show me. Just tell me somehow. Okay, I'm rotten. I'm wicked. I'm evil. I know. Just show me somehow. I got into bed that night and I slept like a baby and I woke the following morning with a heart so joyful and so light I could have danced. Yeah. Resignation. Okay, it became urgent to resign. It became really urgent. It was a matter. This is the fourth day. Okay, after the assembly, the fourth day. (laughs) I wrote 11 pages to the society. And I really let them have it. I didn't expect a polite reply, and I certainly didn't get one. <laughs> um, I wrote to my friends at the same time in the congregation, the only friends I'd ever had in the congregation, no reply. And finally, I wrote to my children, and I knew exactly what was going to happen. And from that day to this, well, we all know, don't we, folks? Okay, complete shunning, absolutely nothing. Life over the past year has been a journey of discovery that has been so desperately precious it's been a learning curve I don't know of any Jehovah's Witness who's actually come out and leapt straight into Christ there must be some somewhere yeah no you did (laughs) for me it was learning okay because Jesus Christ hadn't been for me he'd only been for the 144,000 I had to learn I had to ease myself into it I had to speak to many many Christians I had to overcome the mental obstacles the watchtower mentality the fears, the phobias, don't do this, don't do that. Going into a church the first time, I took my father with me who had to push me over the doorstep. Quite literally, I was out, but he had to push me over the doorstep. And I was still kind of, am I going to get zapped when I'm in here? <laughs> it's, it's, been a, it's been a learning curve. It's, it's Any Christian here who's come, who, who's come out of the Watchtower Society, how do, you, how do you express the joy that you feel? It, it's, you can't express it, can you? He's just there, and he grows. He is in you. It grows by the day, this, this love, this certainty that Jesus is for you. He's there. It's... Oh, come on. Let's spend a night. <laughs> okay. Most of my life is over. I'm almost 60 years old now. I'm very much on my own. I try not to be bitter, but I am. I am. We're never going to grow old, remember? So what's the point of saving towards your old age? <laughs> Okay. All of a sudden you find out you have no pension and you're going to live a long time, yeah. Yeah, life without my family is difficult at times, and that, that's where prayer comes in. Okay. My joy, believe me, joy, let's emphasize that, of being with you this weekend completes a wonderfully spiritual year. A year of growing understanding and growing awe at the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. May he continue to be with all of us and bless us in our efforts. Thank you.